OK, so welcome to the um, 17th or 18th, lost count, Roses uh, Reading Online Sports Economic Seminars. It's been many, many weeks of uh, quarantine, of lockdown, of coronavirus for all of us, but we've been able to uh, meet uh, each week and listen to fantastic uh, research presentations by a wide range of academics from around the world. Um, and today is no different. Another uh, excellent talk uh, in, um, in prospect of Greg Howard of the University of Illinois, uh, who's going to talk uh, on rational inattention in the in field. Um, while the talk's taking place, if you can keep yourselves muted, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, and there's a chat feature. If you can see the chat feature uh, or the conversation, uh, please do ask questions in there during the talk. Greg will talk for about an hour or so, uh, and then there'll be about half an hour uh, there for Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, Vivek, uh, co-author on this research, uh, is in the call and he will be able to answer any kinds of questions of clarification uh, within the, uh, the chat feature. If you can't see the chat feature, please do drop me an email if you want to uh, ask a question or there will be a time for open mic uh, Q&A at the end, um, so you may want to uh, hold on until then. But without any further ado, Greg, please do uh, take away your talk. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you very much, James. Thanks for having um, our paper on the schedule. And thanks everyone for, uh, for coming today. Um, this, is, this paper is called Rational Inattention in the Infield. It's joint work with Vivek uh, Bhattacharya at Northwestern. Um, so let me start by explaining the title a little bit. Um, inattention has been a behavioral bias that has been getting a lot of well, let's say attention in the economics literature uh, in recent years, um, largely because it's a very kind of intuitive, appe intuitively appealing modification to rationality. So maybe it's not that far away from our um, our rational models. And so there's been some some nice work uh, arguing that inattention can explain many of the different behaviors that we've um, that we've discovered that violate rationality. Um, and so maybe it can be a kind of a unifying uh, theory that um, across much of behavioral economics. To that extent, um, one particular type of inattention, rational inattention, has been studied very uh, in depth um, from a theoretical angle. So what rational inattention is, is that it it adds a, an element to a model where there's a cost to processing information to discovering things about the world. Um, and and uh, the way that this these these models work is that they uh, impose very little structure on the type of signals that you can get. Um, so you can choose any sort of signal that you possibly could want, um, but they impose a way to make signals that are more informative about the world more costly. And so um, so what this means is that there's a choice that uh, that agents make uh, before taking actions, which is how much and what type of attention uh, to, to pay to the world. Um, and so there's an optimization problem over the type and amount of the information acquisition that occurs. Most of the existing evidence that we have for rational inattention uh, comes from lab experiments. And that's generally true. It's, it's the way that um, we can look at things in a very kind of controlled environment. Um, but it might not be the best uh, situation to, to apply to rational inattention um, because there is this kind of optimization aspect to it where, where you want to see people that have had the chance to, to think about how what they would pay attention to and how they would make choices. Um, you want them, you want people that are able to, uh, to come in with some experience in the types of questions that are uh, being asked. And that's not going to be true in lab experiments. And so in a survey paper by three of the leading theorists in this, um, in this literature, uh, they have this quote, which is that there's a very high value to testing rational inattention in the field, since decision situations in the lab do not always fit the setup for which rational inattention is meant to be applied to. Um, and so there's, at least so far, there's very little evidence of rational inattention in high stakes or in strategic settings um, in the field. Uh, like I said, most of it's been coming from kind of these low stakes lab experiments, um, primarily probably being done on, on, on undergraduates at various universities. Um, 
And but at the same time, right, we know from exist from some existing papers that kind of experienced agents that are doing things over and over again, they don't they might not suffer as large of behavioral biases as people that have been doing it. Um, uh, people that are kind of new to whatever problem you're putting in front of them. And so that brings us to um, to, to baseball, right? So what we want to argue is that baseball is actually a great setting to test these questions of, uh, of whether people are rationally inattentive. And let me give you four reasons why baseball is such a good setting. The first one is that it is a complex but transparent state space. So there are many possible situations in baseball. Um, I guess before, before I actually, before I get into this, let me just say that if, if you're not um, too familiar with the game of baseball, uh, for the purposes of this talk, I think you can know that it's it's very similar to cricket, and that'll be enough for you to understand what's going on. Um, so, uh, so all of these things would apply to, to, to cricket. We did baseball, though, um, because that's what we're more familiar with here in America. Um, and so the first reason that baseball is so great is that there's a very complex but transparent state space. So there are many possible situations that uh, that a baseball game can be in. Um, and those are things that, as you take actions in the baseball game, you should be paying attention to. Um, we're going to have over kind of a million possible uh, different states of the world uh, in our baseline um, in our baseline estimates. And so that means that it's very plausible that agents aren't going to be able to kind of process what the right payoffs are to all their actions in every single one of those states. That would just be so much information um, that that it would be kind of, uh, or at least it's plausible that they wouldn't be able to, to do that. Um, but at the same time, the econometrician, uh, us, are able to observe all of the really important information. So when we're thinking about like, what's the difference in the score or how late in the game is it? Um, how many uh, strikes are there? Uh, how many balls, how many, where, what runners are on base? Um, those are things that we all, that we can see as, as the econometrician. Um, and so using computers, we can process a lot of this uh, information um, that maybe the players can't. The second reason baseball is so helpful is that there's a strategic interaction between the pitcher um, and the batter. So um, this would also be true in cricket. Um, and it's very similar to a, a setup that you've probably learned in, in your first game theory classes uh, of matching pennies, where the pitcher is trying to throw a pitch that the batter is not expecting, and the batter is trying to expect whatever pitch the pitcher is about to throw. And so there's this strategic element to, to trying to guess um, which, uh, um, which thing is coming or, or which one would actually deceive the batter. And it turns out that when we add rational inattention into a model like this, um, into, into a game theory type model, we get predictions that wouldn't occur in the single agent problem. And so you get these extra predictions that lead us to uh, have extra tests for whether or not these players are being rationally inattentive. The third reason that baseball is so helpful is that it's high stakes. So, I mean, this is uh, we're, we're, for our back of the envelope calculations, um, we're going to use a, a common value in the baseball literature of um, valuing a win at about $10 million. And so that would be kind of the estimate of what teams are willing to pay on the free agent market um, for a player that would add about a one win to their team. And then lastly, uh, there's really good data in baseball. So we're going to have all the pitches that were thrown um, between 2008 and 2017, and that's about 8 million pitches. So we're going to have a lot of data that we can use to, uh, to analyze this game and to look for evidence of rational inattention. So in this talk, um, or in this paper, uh, we're going to do a few things. The first thing is that we're going to introduce a conceptual framework that embeds rational inattention into a matching pennies framework. It's going to generate four predictions um, that we can apply to baseball. The first one, I think, is, is the most natural and would come up in any paper about inattention, which is that you should throw more fastballs when the equilibrium payoff to a fastball is larger. So if you're going to Greg, you've somehow managed to mute yourself. No. 
There Can you go. hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So I don't know how that happened. Um, okay, so you throw more fastballs when the when fastballs are better. I think that one's a very natural prediction. The second prediction of the framework is that when attention costs are lower, and we'll describe what we mean by that, but we have a few dimensions of, of attention costs that we, we're going to talk about, uh, then the, your, that sensitivity should be higher. So you should throw even more fastballs when the payoff is higher um, if attention costs are lower. That, I think that's also a very natural prediction. Um, and then we have two predictions that are based a little bit more on the, the specific um, uh, the specific interact, uh, strategic interaction of the scheme. The first one is that in very high leverage states, in very important parts of the game, then your, the strategies that the players are undertaking are going to converge to what they would be in Nash equilibrium. Um, and uh, just to remind you, the Nash equilibrium of the matching, matching pennies game is that, um, is that you um, uh, that you play mixed strategies over the the possible actions, such that the opponent has uh, equal payoffs it, no matter what they do. And so, um, and so, for the rational and attention case, uh, that's going to, to occur. You're going to play those strategies uh, in the very high leverage states. Um, and then the last prediction, and this one I think is is very specific, like very specific to rational and attention versus any of the other theories that you might think uh, could rationalize some of the other predictions, is that the um, average payoff of fastballs across all states. So here we're taking the average um, across different situations. That should be approximately zero. And this gets to the idea of um, what types of actions do you even consider when um, when uh, making that choice uh, for you to even consider throwing a fastball um, it needs to be that uh, that they're not that much worse on average than other pitches and similarly for you to consider throwing other pitches besides fastballs uh, fastballs can't be that much better either um, and so prediction d is, is really a prediction about consideration states sets but it's something that occurs in equilibrium because of the strategic interaction of the game so once we make those four predictions, we'll move on and we'll uh, look in the baseball data to, to test whether they're true or not. And so for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on the choice between throwing a fastball versus throwing any other type of pitch in baseball. Um, and that's a little bit for exposition and a little bit for time. Um, I'll refer you to, the, you to the paper where we expand those uh, the predictions to be not just about fastballs versus other pitches, but we can split it up by fastball, changeup, curveball, and slider, and we still find uh, that these predictions are true. Then in the last part of the, of the talk, um, we'll think about how costly is, these, is, um, is giving attention to things. So we'll uh, estimate a, a key parameter of the model, and then I'll spend a little bit of time uh, telling you how to interpret that parameter. Okay, so just to, to go over the literature um, fairly quickly, um, there are really three contributions that we make. The first one is that we is a theoretical contribution. We're embedding the theory on rational inattention into a matching pennies game. And the, the real contribution here is that it generates new empirical predictions of rational inattention. Um, the, second, the second contribution is that we're finding evidence of rational inattention in the field, so outside of the lab, which I think is uh, at least for is, is one of the first papers to do that and um, certainly the first one to do it in a strategic setting. Um, and then the, the last thing, of course, and why it fits into this seminar is that we're continuing a long tradition of using sports as a laboratory for studying strategic behavior. And so we're uh, uh, glad to be continuing to uh, demonstrate that sports is such a great spot for this. OK, so let me jump into the to the model. Um, so we're going to we're going to model baseball in this uh, in this simplified framework where it's a game between the pitcher and the batter. The pitcher can choose between two actions to throw a fastball or not a fastball, and the batter can choose between two actions, which is to prepare for a fastball or to prepare for not a fastball. Um, and their payoffs are uh, are zero sum. So um, 
and the batter is going to prefer the ones in the uh, upper left and lower right corners, while the pitcher would prefer the lower left and upper right corners. Um, because the pitcher wants to deceive the batter, the batter wants to uh, be coordinated with the pitcher. And so this is a zero-sum matching pennies game. Um, and so the Nash equilibrium is, uh, is straightforward. The pitcher should choose the, the right mix of fastballs and not fastballs um, in order so that the batter is indifferent between choosing fastball and not fastball. And similarly, the batter should choose the right mix of fastball and not fastball. To, be, to make the pitcher indifferent between choosing fastball and not fastball. And that should occur in every single state. So no matter, uh, so W is going to change with S. And um, so in any state, sorry, S being the state. Um, and so in any state, it should be the case that uh, payoffs are equalized uh, between the pitcher and the batter. But what we're going to do is we're going to modify this by adding rational inattention into it. And here, um, the player can only see a noisy signal of S, um, and they can draw that from any distribution they design. So there's going to be, um, so they're going to design a, um, a, I guess you could say, a joint distribution of the states and the signals um, that are consistent with their prior. And then the cost of that, of the, of the, um, of designing that distribution, is going to be the Shannon cost of information. And so this is the uh, the assumption that's commonly made in the rational and attention literature that's going to lead to particularly tractable results. Um, and so, uh, so in this equation where we have um, C, uh, here we're thinking about the difference in Shannon entropy between the prior and the expected Shannon entropy of the posterior given your signal. We're going to multiply that by an attention parameter lambda um, and that's going to be the cost of the joint distribution that you chose. And the main idea here is that the more the signal structure reduces entropy and expectation, the more expensive it is. And it and uh, the reduction in entropy is going to be what helps uh, players make the right decision. So that's the setup of the game. Um, to solve this, we're gonna uh, we're gonna build on on a literature that spent a while that spent a, a, a lot of effort in, in, in solving this. Um, one of the, the, the key results is that the optimal signal that you choose is going to be a recommendation on whether you throw a fastball or not. So there's no reason to get any extra information rather than that, because that, that would be costly, and it's not going to help you make a decision, um, if, because the recommendation is, is going to make the decision for you. Um, and so that's the best sort of uh, signal that you could ask for. And so um, notation-wise, we're going to assume that uh, the probability of getting a fastball in state S is PFS for the pitcher. We'll assume that the batter is also um, getting a signal with probability QFS. And so they get the payoff um, corresponding to that. So that's what this UP term is. It's just the, the um, what happens from the um, what happens from, from the matching pennies game. And then this cost uh, down here is going, to, um, is going to be the cost of uh, the Shannon entropy uh, between the PFS, which is a state-specific probability, and then P0, which is the average um, probability that you throw a fastball overall. So PS is, is the probability that you throw a fastball in a specific state, P0 is not state specific. It's just the total probability of a fastball across all states. And so the Shannon information um, is going to be measured uh, using that formula. And so then the pitcher just maximizes the, um, the utility, the what they get out of the matching pennies game, minus the cost of processing information. So um, how, do, how does the game aspect of this work? Well, as in standard Nash equilibrium, you're going to take the other agent's um, best responses as given, and then you're going to derive your best response. Um, and the equilibrium is going to be the, the fixed point between those two. Um, and so just notation-wise, 
we're going to simplify things by saying, okay, given the batter's pro uh, strategy, which is this QFS, right? That's the probability that the batter is preparing for a fastball in state S. Um, we're going to define the equilibrium um, payoff to a fastball as this WFS in the top equation up here. And then we're going to define WS to be the difference in the equilibrium payoff of a fastball versus a non-fastball. So, um, so WS is just the, the, um, the benefit that the pitcher gets from um, throwing a fastball versus throwing a non-fastball. And um, in fact, this is going to be something that empirically uh, we're going to try to try to measure later on. And so the result from the maximization problem is that the best response is going to look like a logit um, given here in equation one. And so the probability of throwing a fastball in state S is a function of the overall probability of throwing a fastball P naught, and then how good is fastballs compared to non-fastballs in that state um, adjusted for how costly was attention. Um, and so um, obviously the probability of throwing a fastball is increasing in, in, in the overall probability of throwing a fastball. It's increasing in how good a fastball is in that period. Um, and uh, the degree to which it's increasing depends on lambda. Um, we get a second uh, we get a second equation though, which is that the is, or in, in this case, uh, because of rational inattention, you get a, a second um, uh, a second choice, let's say, of the p naught of the overall probability of throwing a fastball. And that's going to maximize this equation in in um, in equation two. Um, or down here, um, where you choose the p naught to to be maximizing your expected utility, um, given that the p s's are going to follow this equation and in, in, or follow this formula in equation one. And so these are results that have uh, uh, been derived by theorists before, um, but they're going to be very helpful in in helping us uh, make predictions. So let me get into to what we think what we learn. Um, from this uh, from this model, and there are going to be four, and maybe we could say four and a half predictions of rational inattention. Now, the first one is that, unlike in Nash equilibrium, we don't require that the payoffs are equalized across states. So the win probability added of a fastball compared to a not fastball (WS) does not always have to be zero in every state. And that would have been the prediction in Nash equilibrium. Because we've added this attention cost, that's not necessarily going to be true. Then, um, then based on kind of just the logit uh, uh, equation that we had from before, we get predictions A and B. And the first one is that um, when payoffs to fastballs are higher, when you have a higher, yeah, when not, you have a higher WS. Um, then you're going to throw more fastballs in that state. So there should be a, a correlation between uh, when WS is bigger and when PFS is bigger. Second, when we lower the cost of attention, so lambda, when that's lower, you become more sensitive to these payoff differences. So in that case, when WS increases, uh, PFS should increase more than if uh, attention costs were higher. Um, and so those are those are only based on kind of the the single agent problem. Um, you would expect this to be true in in any rational inattention setting. For C and D, they're a little bit more specific to the um, to the matching pennies aspect. And so for C, this is um, what this is saying is that when you're in a really important state of the game, when leverage is high, um, and here. The way we're we're thinking about it is if there is a continuum of states where all the payoffs are scaling up with a parameter L, then as that parameter L leverage gets really high, um, the strategies that the players choose are going to converge to the strategies that they would have picked um, under Nash equilibrium if there were no attention costs at all. And then finally, um, the um, we get this last prediction that 
the expected value across all states of the wind probability added of fastballs or the payoffs of fastballs should be about zero um, as long as, as lambda is, is large. Um, and this is an approximate uh, equation and um, because it depends a little bit on, on the size of lambda. Um, but what we're going to show is that we can't statistically distinguish it from zero. And then later on, we'll show you that it's actually quite a tight prediction um, once we know what lambda is. So this is these um, five-ish predictions, yeah, four and a half predictions are going to be the um, basis for where we go the rest of the talk. When we get into the empirical tests, we're just going to go through these uh, one by one and show that these are all true in the baseball setting. And that's going to be our evidence that indeed um, baseball players are being rationally inattentive. So the data that we're going to use is going to be the MLB game day data, data set from PitchFX. Um, we basically have every pitch in um, Major League Baseball for 10 years. That's going to be a lot of pitches. Um, we're only keeping regular season games. Um, they have postseason, but those are there are a lot fewer of them, and strategies can be somewhat different. Um, they also even have spring season, but um, or spring training, but those they're the they're the teams don't really care about winning, so um, we we drop those as well. Um, from this data, we know the score, the count, the base situation. So that's like if there's a runner on first base, if there's a runner on second base, etc. Um, we know how many outs there are. We know the inning. We know who the pitcher and the batter are. And we know what type of pitch the pitcher throws. Um, so whether they throw a fastball or not. And we also see a variety of outcomes or payoffs in this data. So um, the main thing that we're going to use is the win probability, which is so based on uh, the situation in the game, using historical data, you can calculate the probability that the team is actually going to win the game. Um, and so you can look at how much does that change um, because of the outcome of that pitch or that at bat. And so that's going to be our main outcome of interest. Um, for robustness, we can also look at how many more runs score in that inning, which is going to be highly correlated to, to um, how well the pitcher is doing, um, or a dummy for, for winning the game itself, though that's going to be pretty noisy. Um, we also use another uh, metric that's, I guess, let's say preferred by, by a lot of the uh, baseball analytics guys, um, which is which we call field independent pitching. And this is a measure that's supposed to um, capture uh, how well the pitcher is doing, um, but strip out a lot of the noise that comes from the randomness of um, that comes from the randomness of baseball. Um, namely that if you put the ball in play and it's not a home run, uh, then there seems to be a lot of randomness as to whether the runner gets out or whether he gets a hit, um, the difference between maybe uh, uh, hitting the ball straight at the center fielder or a little bit or in between the center fielder and right fielder, which can have dramatically different outcomes, uh, but probably was more random than having anything to do with how good the pitcher is. And so this measure where they get heavily penalized for home runs, uh, they get slightly penalized for, for walks, and they get a bonus for strikeouts, um, that's a um, this is a, a, a well-known measure of uh, the pitcher's performance. And I should note that a better score is lower. So it's like they're, it's supposed to be comparable to the, um, the number of runs that they give up. Um, but, but for here, um, lower is better. And then the last thing that we measure in this data is, um, is leverage. Remember, we, leverage is going to be a key part of our prediction C. Um, and so, for leverage, we're going to measure it as the variance in win probability added, um, which is the which is the way that we can measure the importance of the state. So we're going to split the data by uh, uh, some of the um, aspects of the situation, like the score and what inning it is, and that'll help us see like how important um, how how important is the is that part of the game. So, um, so now, now that you know the data, now that you know the predictions, we can go through our results. So the first prediction was that um, Nash equilibrium was not going to hold. 
and or at least not in every single state. Um, and the way that that would be uh, that would be violated is if the um, the payoffs for the pitcher are not equalized between throwing a fastball and not throwing a fastball in every state. Um, now to to run these tests, right? I told you, uh, um, or the states that we're going to consider, there are a ton of them. Um, so the count, which is the number of strikes and the number of balls that the uh, that the pitcher has thrown, um, the number of outs, the inning, um, where base runners are on, the difference in score between the two teams, um, who the pitcher is, and the handedness of the batter, so whether they're right or left-handed, that's going to be our baseline set of state fixed effects. And there are going to be more than a million of those. So we don't want to just test, okay, did were the, um, uh, or, well, we wouldn't be able to just test um, do fastballs have the same outcome measures as non-fastballs in every single one of those states, because there are more than a million of them. Um, and some of them have very few, uh, very few observations in them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to aggregate to categories of states. And here are the categories that we're, that we're going to talk about just in, in our baseline is just how many strikes are there in the count. So, um, um, so you, so you, uh, you get three strikes before you strike out in baseball. And so there could be zero, one, or two strikes. And we're going to aggregate states that have zero strikes altogether. And we're going to estimate, OK, how much better or worse are fastballs in those specific states. Um, and so this regression is going to be that. Beta uh, zero would be how, many, how much better are fastballs with zero strikes. Beta one would be how much better are they with one strike. And beta two would be how much better are they with two strikes. And the results are in this table below. Um, and so we, we look at it for a variety of outcome measures. So win probability added uses or is the win probability across um, uh, 50 or 80 years of, of baseball data. I forget exactly how many. For the in sample win probability added, it's just going to be using the data from um, uh, within our data in the years that we're, we're measuring. Um, and then we also have the field independent pitching measure. We have whether you win the game or not, and we have the runs remaining that the pitcher is going to give up. And so for runs remaining and field independent pitching, lower is better. For everything else, higher is better. Um, and what you see consistently over the five columns is that with zero strikes, um, fastballs are beneficial to the pitcher. And with two strikes, um, fastballs are worse for the pitcher. And with one strike, they're about they're about even. Um, and so this is a rejection of Nash equilibrium because Nash equilibrium would, should say that for any aggregation of categories that you can think of, uh, they should be zero. And these are very very highly not zero. Um, these I mean, they're economically the the effects are. Um, are, are in fact uh, meaningful, right? If you think about uh, the number of fastballs you throw over a game in each of these situations, um, we calculate in the paper that um, that uh, I think a 20%, um, sorry, 20% more fastballs with zero strikes and 20% fewer fastballs with two strikes could lead to another win or two over the course of a season. Um, so that's a pretty big effect, uh, given that wins are, are quite valuable in this um, uh, in this context. So this rejects um, Nash equilibrium um, uh, based on kind of a variety of outcome measures. Now, one of the things you might be concerned about at this point is that I define these state fixed effects to be very. Um, uh, I mean, there are a lot of them, right? We're controlling for many things in this regression, um, but you might not think that it's sufficient, right? Um, and so over the next two slides, I want to argue that, in fact, when we add even more controls, that our results don't change that much. And so here we're looking at a graphical um, uh, version of the same regression results. So in the green um, on, on the left here, uh, this one, this one, and this one is the same uh, thing that we saw in the table for win probability added. Um, 
And so with no strikes, you win probability added of a fastball is slightly positive. With two strikes, it's slightly ne it's somewhat negative. And then in these other ones, we're going to interact the state fixed effects that we had, so all million of them, with even more things um, that you might be concerned about that could be an omitted variable that might affect both whether the pitcher throws a fastball and whether or not they uh, get a beneficial result. And so here we're including the month and year in orange, um, and the results don't change that much, though they lose a little bit of statistical significance. We can include the weather of the game. So there we're um, counting whether it's raining or not, um, or drizzling, because with too much rain, they'll cancel the game. And we're also including uh, temperature bins at um, about every, uh, I guess, about every five degrees Celsius. Uh, we're using Fahrenheit, so it's 10 degrees. Um, we also can include what ballpark you're playing in and the start time of the game. Um, we can include how tired the pitcher might be based on the number of pitches he's already thrown. That doesn't change much at all. <clears throat> and we can include um, the choice of, of recent pitches to see if, okay, well, maybe you had thrown a curveball recently, and so your fastball is going to be more effective. Um, it turns out that that doesn't affect the results either. Um, the other big th concern that you might have is that we didn't control for the identity of the batter. Um, we just controlled for whether they were right or left-handed. Um, and that was really for power reasons. So let me start actually from the far right side of this of this graph with the kind of grayish um, dots. That one we do include just who the batter is. Um, and there we get uh, very noisy results that um, would be hard to interpret. But as we add in um, controls about the batter, uh, we can still get um, we can still get uh, similar results to our baseline um, that don't kill our power. And so we do think that that if we had more data, we could include the batter and, and we would get the same results um, based on, based, or at least that's what we think these other controls hint at. Um, and it's just unfortunate that we don't have the data to fully interact the pitcher, the batter, and all the, um, and all the controls that we think are important to the state of the game. And so including who the, what team the batter is on, um, what, uh, or here we use uh, k-means clustering on the batters to split them into three types of batters. Um, neither of those makes much of a difference at all. Um, when we do finer batter types, uh, it starts getting noisy again. Um, so there, we're, I think we're using about 10 or 20 batters, batter types, um, again, using k-means clustering. And so the result there is still uh, significant for two strikes. Um, it loses its significance for no strikes. Um, but we think that overall that um, that this is suggestive that if we had if we had more data, we could include batters, and we don't think it would change our our, our main result. Okay, so um, hopefully now you're convinced that <coughs> excuse me. Um, hopefully now you're convinced that um, that there are deviations from Nash equilibrium, um, and so we should be thinking about okay, what uh, well is there evidence in fact of rational inattention? Um, and so let's get into the first prediction that comes from rational inattention, which is that the fastball, the probability of throwing a fastball should be correlated to the payoffs of throwing a fastball. And so on the left-hand side of this graph, I've now split it up into more than just strikes. I've split it up by the number of strikes and the number of balls, or, um, we, or in baseball terms, we would call that the count. Um, and you can see that, um, that there is kind of a, that there continue to be deviations from zero across a variety of those counts. On the right-hand side, I've put just the probability that pitchers throw a fastball in, um, in any of those counts. And just by looking at this, you can see the same pattern in the wind probability added by fastball that you see in the probability of throwing a fastball. And on the right-hand side, I think we do actually have the confidence intervals on these. They're just smaller than the dots, so they don't come through. Uh, that one we measure very precisely compared to the win probability added. And so if I put these on the same graph and put uh, the probability on the x-axis and the relative win probability on the y-axis, you can see visually um, that there's an upward sloping relationship between these two. And I've transformed those probabilities into the relative log odds. 
um, because that's a little bit more theoretically grounded and will come in useful later in the talk. Um, and here we've done it by the count, right? So that's just not the number of balls and strikes, but we can actually split it into finer categories as well. So here we've split it by not just the count, but also the count and the number of outs. And you still see this robust upward sloping relationship. Um, you can kind of imagine a, a line going through the origin um, that goes through these dots fairly well. Um, or uh, even if we split it out by the number, the count, the number of outs, and where runners are on base, uh, you still get this uh, upward sloping thing. So the number of dots and the preciseness of the dots, uh, or sorry, the number of dots goes up as we uh, expand the number of categories, and the precision with which we measure the win probability added goes down. Um, and so you get more dispersion in these in these graphs, um, but nonetheless, uh, you can see still see an upward sloping relationship here. So that is, uh, I think, strong evidence that indeed fastball probabilities are correlated to the payoffs of throwing a fastball. So the second thing that we can look at is um, is whether the whether having lower attention costs makes you more sensitive. So the idea here being like, if you have low attention costs, when payoffs are high, do you throw even more fastballs than you would otherwise? And the way we're going to do this is, well, we know when payoffs are high, it's when there are zero strikes. Um, and we know when payoffs are low, it's when there are two strikes. And so we're going to look at the probability that you throw a fastball, and that'll be on the left-hand side of this regression. Um, and we're going to regress that on um, whether you whether there are zero or two strikes in the count, and interact that with um, how costly is attention for you. And we're going to control for all our other state fixed effects, so the number of balls, the number of outs. So you should think about this as a um, as comparing like the same pitcher, the same uh, inning. Um, if there's one strike versus two strikes, how much more likely are they to throw a fastball? Um, and if there's one strikes versus zero strikes, how much less likely are they to throw a fastball? Now, our theory would suggest um, that maybe we should do this as a logit, but that's computationally difficult, and we're fairly uh, we're on the we're on the uh, very kind of linear interior part of that of a logit curve anyway. Uh, so we're not doing that here. Now, the big question here is how do you measure these lower attention costs? And we're going to have five things that we use to measure it. The first two are going to be um, how analytics -y is your baseball team. So there's been uh, a great variety in how much baseball teams have embraced, um, let's say, the uh, big data revolution, where some baseball teams are hiring lots of statisticians and economists and all those types of things to, to make better decisions. And they're being run by kind of, I mean, the critic, the, the, if, if you've read the the, um, the book Moneyball, this is exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, uh, and then some teams have, have, have been more old school and have not uh, have not wanted to use these as much. And so we're going to have two measures of how analytics-y you are. One is how much you use the defensive shift, which is a strategy that um, during our time period was much more favored by the analytics-y teams. Um, the other one is going to be a subjective ranking that comes from ESPN. That if you just Google like what are the most analytic teams in baseball, this would be high near high on that list. We're also going to use some other um, things that we think correlate to attention. Um, one is going to be the age of the pitcher, um, and then maybe two slight or so. So the idea being that as people get older, uh, their ability to process information to pay attention goes down. Um, psychology studies actually suggest that this maybe peaks at around the age of 20. And so over the course of baseball careers, uh, they're generally decreasing. Um, we're also going to be doing some, I guess you could call it more quasi-experimental um, type things. One is looking at the temperature. So on a really hot day, it's, it's harder to pay, to pay attention. And so we're going to compare days in which it's over uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit to those in which it's not. Um, that would be about, I think, 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and we'll also look at afternoon starts. Uh, so some baseball games start earlier in the day. 
Um, most baseball players are night owls. They get home from the stadium after midnight and might stay up a few more hours. They wake up kind of pretty late in the morning. And so if you're starting a game at 1 p.m., um, that can be uh, hard on, on baseball players. <clears throat> and so these are the results. Um, so remember the, the left-hand side here is the probability of throwing a fastball um, compared to the same situation with one strike. And so in the first two columns, uh, this is just confirming what we showed before. Um, you do throw more strike, you do throw more uh, uh, fastballs and zero strike counts and fewer in two strike counts. And then um, in columns one and two, what this shows is that teams that are more invested in analytics, um, and we're using a dummy for being in the top, uh, and being in about the top 10 team baseball teams of being in analytics, um, you uh, you do throw more strikes and zero strike counts and fewer in two strike counts. In column three, we show that um, that older pitchers throw uh, adjust less to the to how many strikes there are. So um, so younger pitchers who have lower attention costs are adjusting more. Um, in column four, we show that when the temperature is really high, you adjust less. Um, and in column five, this is the least statistically significant of our of our tests, but in the afternoon, you also adjust a little bit less. And so there we you can see in the joint p value at the bottom that together they're um, significant at the five percent level, um, but individually uh, individually they're not. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, that confirms prediction B. For prediction C, um, this is the prediction that says that in high leverage situations, in really important states of the game, you should play close, um, your strategies should be close to what they would be under Nash equilibrium. And so we don't actually know what the right, what the quote unquote Nash equilibrium strategies are, um, or the right strategies, I guess that was what I meant to put in quotes. Um, and so what we're gonna do is an indirect test instead. And so what we're gonna be able to do is we can test for the equality of normalized payoffs. And um, in this case, the fact that we have a measure of field independent pitching is gonna be really important. Is field independent pitching doesn't depend on how important the state of the game is. <clears throat> and in fact, you can think of it as the win probability added, which was kind of our, our, our preferred measure is equal to a constant times the field independent pitching measure. Um, times the leverage of the game. And so field independent pitching is going to be this uh, um, this measure that we can test. OK, is that equalized um, as leverage gets really high? And if it is, that would be suggest or that would tell us that players are, in fact, um, playing um, playing the Nash strategies, um, even though we don't uh, necessarily know what the Nash strategy should have been. Or, so we, so we can't just test, OK, are you throwing the right percentage of fastballs? Because we don't know what the right percentage of fastballs is. What we can test is whether FIP is being equalized across um, across counts. And so we run this regression where now we're splitting um, our states not just by the number of strikes in the count, but also by how important is it, uh, by how much leverage there is, this leverage bin B. So we're going to split it into um, 10, uh, 10 categories of leverage. Um, and I'm just going to show you graphically what that looks like. So in orange is what um, the FIP is. Uh, so on the x-axis is how important is the state, so measured by leverage. On the y-axis is how much um, uh, how much uh, FIP is uh, higher when you throw a fastball versus a non-fastball. Um, and keep in mind FIP a lower FIP is better, so higher is bad for the pitcher. And so with two strikes over, um, what you can see is that there's a bow shape where for, for very low leverage states, well, it's pretty noisy. Um, <clears throat> and then in the mid leverage states, uh, you get that um, throwing a fastball is worse for the pitcher. Uh, but then in the very high leverage states, it seems to be going down um, and it's statistically indistinguishable from zero. Um, you get the opposite pattern, kind of the opposite pose shape for zero strikes. And so 
Um, so the prediction, though, is that as, as we go to the right, as leverage gets really high, uh, these should be converging to zero. And that does indeed seem to be the case. Our theory, just to be clear, our theory doesn't actually make any sort of prediction on what FIP should look like um, on the left-hand side of this graph. Uh, our theory doesn't predict that it should be monotonically decreasing over the whole or monotonically converging to zero over the whole um, over the whole distribution. And we do some computer simulations in the appendix to show that this is actually a very reasonable um, uh, shape for this for the graph to look like on that side as well. Um, but the key part is that as we go to the right on this graph, as, as leverage converges to infinity, um, then the difference in FIP should converge to zero. And so we think that this confirms that prediction as well. OK, so the last prediction that we made, um, and this one um, kind of gets a little bit more to the heart of rational inattention because it's more about the uh, ahead of time decision. So this is not something, this is, I think, why we really need to be testing it in the field compared to things in the lab, um, is that there should be approximate payoff equivalence on average. So, um, so whether or not you throw a fastball overall um, shouldn't the, the payoff difference uh, should be approximately zero. And so I keep saying approximately um, because it's not a, it's not a, a, a strict zero theoretically, um, but it does need to be fairly close to zero. And once we know what lambda is, which is going to be in the next section, we can say exactly how close to zero it is. Um, but for for at this point in the talk, we're just going to compare it to zero um, because it's 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 very close. Um, so you'll just have to take my word for it for now, and we'll return to it in a few slides. And so, oh, sorry. And so to do this, um, we can run the same regression that we were doing, except now we don't need to interact whether the whether you're throwing a fastball with the category of state. We just look at, OK, the payoff, uh, and we regress it on whether or not you threw a fastball. Now, to truly get the average treatment effect, um, the right thing to do econometrically is to weight by the inverse variance of fastball state by state. And so that's what we're doing in this um, uh, in this top panel. Um, but since that's maybe a little bit unnatural, um, even though it's correct, we also do show the unweighted results. And so across a variety of our measures, including kind of our, our two favorite, which is when probability added and field independent pitching, um, you get a fairly tight zero on um, on uh, on the payoff difference on average, um, and so this is kind of confirming that um, indeed our uh, um, this prediction seems to be holding. Now, it doesn't hold that tight, or it it we do get a statistically significant effect on runs remaining. Um, there are a couple of reasons you might think that uh, that this could happen. In, I mean, runs remaining is not truly what the um, what the pitcher is trying to maximize. It's just correlated to it. And so you could imagine kind of some situations where there's very little effect of, on the game where it is fine for the pitcher to give up runs. Um, and so they might be, and those might be correlated with them throwing fastballs. So, um, so we're not too worried about that. It's also just marginally significant at about like a 0 0.04 uh, p-value. So two stars here is, is, is the 5% rule. Um, <clears throat> all right. And so we take this overall as, as evidence that um, in favor of, of the approximate payoff equivalence uh, prediction that our theory made. OK, so in the last five minutes, I want to spend some time quantifying this lambda parameter from our theory, which is how costly was attention. Remember, lambda multiplied um, the Shannon information of your strat of your signal, um, and so it's a it's a useful parameter in um, in these models to to understand how costly information is. Um, and so remember, we, the the way we're going to estimate it is that we have this uh, logit um, equation that comes from um, 
that comes from the the theory that the probability in state s is related to, to all this stuff on the right hand side and i can rewrite that equation linearly um, where now i have um the win probability added ws so that's the thing that we've been estimating all this time um, divided by the attention cost is equal to uh, these relative log odds of throwing a fastball in state s versus throwing a fastball overall and so um, and of course lambda measures is the measure of the cost of attention and is the parameter of interest and so what this means is i can run the, a regression of um, the estimated win probability added in a category of states so here i've switched from s to n because n is measure is the category of states um, and i can regress that on the relative log odds of throwing a fastball in that category of states um, these uh, uh, PFNs um, transformed in the appropriate way. Um, and then I can, I, I can run that regression and I get, I'll get an alpha and a lambda. Um, and so that lambda will tell us kind of what the, how costly is attention in this, in this situation. Um, it turns out that actually, if you test that alpha equals zero as well, that's actually a stronger prediction than the prediction I just showed you about D that payoff should be approximately equal on average. That's um, so so you can show that theoretically that um, that it's that it would imply D, whereas D would not imply that alpha equals zero. Um, but uh, but I think the intuition around alpha equals zero is a lot harder. There's no there's no kind of thing to say about consideration sets that makes sense to me. Um, so we're going to show it, but. Uh, um, uh, but we still like keeping prediction D around because I think it's um, it has a lot more intuition to it. <clears throat> and so this is the um, regression that we're going to run on the top. And just to remind you, right, I showed you I actually showed you this this graph before when we were testing prediction A. So on the x axis is again the relative log odds of throwing a fastball, which is what's on the right hand side here. And on the left hand side is the relative win probability added to the fastball. And so what this regression is going to be doing is actually just drawing the line that I was trying to visually say uh, you could you could imagine um, when you looked at this. And so <clears throat> when we run that regression, we get that lambda is about 1.4. And that's whether we use categories of states that are count. That's the count, which is balls and strikes, or the count and the out. Um, and indeed, we can't reject that alpha equals 0. Um, those are pretty tight zeros, so we're happy about that. Okay, so now we have this estimate of uh, now we have this estimate of, of the attention cost, which is one point four. So what does that mean? I mean, so in um, in um, in in kind of uh, formal terms, it's the Lambda is the cost in baseball wins of a natural log bit of information, um, but that probably isn't very helpful. And so <clears throat> we can transform that into just one bit of information, which would be the answer to a yes or no question. And that would cost about one one thousandth of a win in this setting, um, or you could say 10,000 US dollars based on the $10 million I, I uh, talked about earlier in the talk. Um, but again, that's that's also a little bit hard to, to process. Um, and so I think the right way to think about this is that always pitching the right pitch um, would cost uh, about 9,770 US dollars. So if, if, the, if you asked for a signal that always told you to throw a fastball with zero strikes and always told you to throw a, a non-fastball with two strikes, um, the Shannon information cost of that would be about 9,770 US dollars. But the strategy that pitchers currently employ is much lower. It only costs about 234 US dollars. Um, and so this is suggestive that, that indeed uh, um, uh, the cost is that pitchers are kind of economizing on attention uh, significantly. Now, of course, these calculations are would only hold in partial equilibrium. So you could think about maybe doing this once. If you were always doing it, then batters would respond as well. Uh, they would change how much they're paying in, in um, how much attention they're paying. And so this wouldn't hold all the time. You couldn't just um, 
always benefit from this. Okay, in the last few, in the last minute, um, let me revisit prediction D. I kept saying that, okay, it's an approximate prediction. Um, how tight is it really? And so the equation that generates prediction D is that actually the, the expected value of the wind probability has to be smaller than the variance of the wind probability divided by two times the attention cost. And so it, that's what I said, as attention costs get higher, um, you expect this, uh, this has to go to zero. Um, and so just visualizing this based on our estimate of lambda from the last slide or two slides ago, and also the data on the variance in wind probability, um, we, can, we can say, okay, this is how tight this prediction has to be. And so that's actually under, um, in the orange line uh, below the axis is the range for mixing under rational inattention. So if fastballs were always, if, if they were better and outside that range, then you would just always throw fastballs regardless of uh, the state because it wouldn't make sense for you to pay any attention to the state. It would be uh, smarter for you to just always choose fastballs um, uh, no matter what, because on average you're, you're uh, because paying attention is, is um, too costly for it to be worthwhile to, to bother. Um, and then on the on the other side, if if fastballs were on average worse than and outside that range, you would never throw fastballs. You would always throw other pitches. <clears throat> um, other predictions that could generate some of our other or other theories that could generate some of our other predictions include uh, quantile response. Um, I didn't talk about that much in this talk, so I'm not going to spend much time on it now, but they have much broader ranges for this one. So they would not make a prediction that it has to be zero. The zero could be compatible with it. And so then above the axis in olive here, we have the confidence interval um, from our estimated uh, average wind probability added. And you'll notice that it is zero and uh, it was also pretty tight on this range. And so the fact that uh, they overlap and, and we can't reject that we're in that range uh, it was a very tight prediction um, and that this really does have a lot of empirical content. Um, and given that rational inattention makes this um, uh, this prediction very starkly, whereas other theories would uh, would only have it be zero by coincidence, I think is evidence in favor of rational inattention. I've also included the confidence intervals for zero strikes and two strikes there just for reference to give you a sense that some of the tests that we're doing would have definitely been outside that zero. So let me wrap up. Um, I think there are three kind of takeaways from this talk. One is that you can embed rational inattention into a matching penalties game and that it generates kind of these new testable predictions. Um, second is that we found evidence by kind of highly experienced um, well-incentivized professionals that they indeed are also rationally inattentive. And lastly, that um, I would say that, that uh, sports continues to be just a great place to study um, both game theory and behavioral economics. So thank you guys all very much. I'm really looking forward to uh, any questions or comments that you have. Okay, thank you very much, Greg, for a really interesting talk. Uh, a few uh, comments in the uh, chat area. Uh, Carl's asked a few questions. Uh, first of all, asking you about whether you assume serial independence. Um, yeah, so in our baseline, I think we are basically making that assumption, but we do a lot of work to, um, to test it. So in one of our regressions, we um, control for kind of the recent pitches that have been thrown, um, which would adjust for it as well. And then we can also look at um, uh, kind of more dynamic outcomes. So you might think, okay, well, um, I don't just care about whether the win probability added of this at bat because maybe my choice to throw a fastball also affects the next at bat or more or, or, um, or kind of things for the rest of the inning. And so that's one of the reasons we use the runs remaining in the inning as one of our outcomes. Um, I mean, it would be great if we had the statistical power to use wins as our outcome, but even with 8 million pitches, that's a little bit uh, infeasible here. Okay. Uh, and then he asks, uh, you, you talked about teams that were analy analytics -y. Yeah. And he wondered whether that might be dependent on the general manager. Uh, for sure, yeah. So the, I mean, um, at least anecdotally, there have been some general managers that have really embraced it. 
Um, so I guess Billy Bean is the most uh, um, well known of those, but uh, I guess Theo Epstein would also be a good example of that. I, I don't know if I don't know if you guys have heard of these people, um, but uh, but for sure, I think the general manager kind of sets the tone for how they run, how much analytics is is in the clubhouse, and how much it influences the decisions of the it, during a game. Yeah. Then in terms of inattention, Carl wonders whether you might want to think about distance travel to go to a game in terms of tiredness and therefore inattention. Yeah, that would uh, that would be a good test and actually it's probably pretty easy to implement so we should definitely add that to our list well, well, thanks for the suggestion and also days away from home if that's possible to measure as well um i mean we probably could it would that would definitely be more distance would be very very easy to add uh days away from home i imagine we could if we but we might need to hire an ra or something um <laughs> yeah okay uh and then zach says uh, he says, I forget, but do you have data on pitch location? So the data does include pitch location. Um, we haven't used it to this point. So so I did mention that in the paper, we don't just do fastballs, non-fastballs. We also do the type of pitch. Um, and all the results are going to um, hold for that. Um, but uh, for pitch location, we were a little bit more hesitant because I think it's, it's easy to uh, to miss with your pitch location in a way that you're not going to accidentally throw a changeup when you meant to throw a fastball, um, but you might very well throw it outside when you meant to throw it inside, and so um, and so then you would expect, of course, if you miss, that's going to be correlated to uh, to bad outcomes in general. Presumably, you wanted to throw it outside for a reason, um, and so then throwing it inside would. Uh, probably lead to worse outcomes. Um, and so we couldn't think of a way to um, uh, to write down a, uh, or to, to test um, kind of the choice of location that in a way that would be unbiased. Okay, um, Zach followed that up, but with not being uh, so familiar with baseball jargon, I'm not necessarily sure whether Zach's follow up um, necessarily was was what you were saying. So Zach, I don't know if you wanted to unmute yourself uh, and give some sense of whether that addressed your question. Yeah, of course. Um, I totally agree that yeah, you can't really mess up. Yeah, I'm going to throw a fastball. Oops, I threw I threw a change. <laughs> um, yeah. But I still think, given you know the amount of observations you have, and I know it can get issues with power can be really tough with all those different state fixed effects you have. But still, I think it would just be interesting to see, you know, when high strike counts, you have two strikes, less than three balls, mm -hmm. are you more likely to throw a pitch outside of the zone? Again, yeah. there could be issues with, I meant to throw it inside in the zone, but I didn't. <laughs> but still, on average, you know, what does that look like? And then looking to see for those pitches outside of the zone, does it actually increase your win probability? It's just anecdotally as a baseball watcher for whatever, 20 years or so. <laughs> um, you know, in two strike counts with, you know, zero balls, one or two, they're trying to get him to chase. Yeah. Chase at a bad pitch, get out on a bad pitch. Does that happen empirically? And, you know, does that increase their win probability? Again, I think that would be a different paper, but I think it could be really interesting. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I think you, you would definitely have to be really careful in – um, in thinking through the the bias that would come from uh, from kind of mistakenly meaning to throw it down and outside, but actually yeah. hanging it over the plate. Um, but I think it would be really a, a really interesting um, uh, thing to look into. Okay, and then Pama asks in the chat, do you think fastballs are really important in baseball? False ball. He doesn't know what it's called in baseball. Uh, as face false balls are allowed in baseball, isn't it optimal to throw a false ball along with a fast ball? Um, sorry, I I'm not sure I understood. Okay, Trauma, do you want to ask the question yourself rather than I try and do it badly? Uh, like uh, what I mean to say that like in uh, baseball, you can throw like a. Uh, uh, like a uh, real ball as well as you can like uh, uh, 
uh, throw uh, another ball, uh, like a, a red ball or something like that. Like uh, what we say wide in cricket. Uh -huh. So you can like mix the strategy. Like you don't have to uh, like throw fast ball ev uh, like every time. Mm -hmm. So because yeah. like, yeah, so, so it, like it might not be optimal to uh, throw fast ball every time. Oh yeah. Seeing that, the things. Yeah, that's definitely right. So I'm guessing you asked this question when I was kind of going through the how costly it would be to always throw a fastball or yes. never throw yes. a fastball. Yeah, and so that was purely just to give you a sense of how costly things were. Um, that definitely would not be kind of the equilibrium optimal strategy. Um, the you could imagine that in partial equilibrium, if you hold the batter's uh, strategy as constant then you might want to do, then that would be your optimal strategy. But of course the batter is going to adjust to your strategy as well. Um, and so you would never, uh, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't last very long if you, if you tried to pursue that, I agree. Yes, uh, and another thing is also that like, if like uh, you have like the best player or like, or the best batsman, like <laughs> just let him like uh, uh, have the base so that like you, you have another player so that you can out him um like you can you can throw like uh, the false ball so that uh -huh. he he can have a base so that the next player will be a uh, not a good player so that you can uh, like, ah, okay uh, yes so occasionally something like that happens in baseball which is the intentional walk i think you're talking about um, yes, yes. <laughs> okay yeah so um Sorry, so, so, so yeah we ended um i didn't get into all of the data cleaning we did, we dropped all of the intentional walks because that's not really the, I mean, that's signaled ahead of time. It's no longer in the matching pennies framework, um, at least in, I don't know exactly how that would work in cricket, but in baseball, the catcher like stands up and puts his hand off to the side so that uh, the pitcher knows to throw it way away from from the batter. And in fact, in, in recent years though, after our data, they've gotten rid of it completely and they just tell the umpire, hey, I want to walk the guy and he goes to first, so. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah, no, good questions. Great, thank you. And then Stefan has a question. And again, rather than me ask you, Stefan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Consuming isn't yes, busy well, making bread. All right. Hi, uh, hi Greg. Very, very interesting. I, uh, perhaps something I'm not quite getting about this, but if, if it's optimal, uh, if, there's, if there's an advantage, if there's a higher win probability added to um a fastball on the first pitch uh mm -hmm. rather than when uh, you're um the you got two strikes then why don't batters optimally adjust for this i mean they have attention as well so yeah. wouldn't i pay particular attention to the first ball and just knock it out of the park and, and, and <laughs> i mean I, i'm not a baseball expert but isn't it true to say that um, home runs are somewhat easier with fast balls than with other balls. Uh, yes, that is true. Um, I think to your broader question, um, I think the what we would say is that the reason that these differences exist at all is because uh, the batters are also somewhat inattentive. Um, so they go up, they prepare for something ahead of time. Um, they kind of know... Uh, kind of on average what the pitcher is likely to throw, um, but they're not fully re-optimizing their strategy for every pitch. So they have kind of their baseline strategy. They, op they, they adjust a little bit, but not so much that they completely wipe out the, pay out the payoff differences um, per pitch. Um, Isn't the problem with that that the payoff differences are very large? That's what you show, right? So it's a very big difference in payoff. So. Um, there's a very I, okay. So I guess there um, there's a very there's a very statistically strong um, difference in payoffs when you use ten years of data. Um, but on the per pitch level, I'm not sure that it's enormous. Right. So these are on uh, um, we're talking about like I think something on the order of one one thousandth of a win, right? So um, so it's. Uh, so there are differences, I don't, and, and, and I think we have strong statistical evidence of those differences. Um, but I think they're within reason that the batter might uh, might still have attention costs that kind of prevent him from re-optimizing every single pitch. 
Well, okay. Well, maybe put it put it this way then. Um, so, should Billy Bean hire you because you can improve the quality of the performance of his team, or is it just not worth it? <laughs> no, it's too small an effect. Wh which way? Which way around is it? Um, I mean, I think I think if uh, given how much. Um, how cheap economists are compared to baseball players. It wouldn't necessarily be a bad choice for him. Uh, but I think that there probably are other margins in which he can be devoting his time to um, to also uh, um, to also getting more wins. Right? I think like better better signing of free agents and things like that seems to be, or or better preparing your own minor league players for the major leagues. Uh, those seem to be kind of the exciting places where you can really had win probability from a st statistician's point of view. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, 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 in a way. I mean, I suppose, the, I suppose the other question is, shouldn't you really, if you're going to model the inattention of the, of, the, of the pitcher, shouldn't you really model the inattention of the batter? I mean, isn't it incomplete if you don't do that? Yeah, so the, um, I mean, it, within the model, we can do that. Um, the problem, though, is that we don't actually observe what the batter is preparing for. And so a lot of the tests that we run for the pitcher, um, we don't, we can't do that for the batter because we don't see whether they're ready for a fastball or ready for, um, or ready for a curveball. Um, I guess nowadays with, with even, um, with all the like cameras and technology that they have in baseball stadiums, um, we could probably start to see like, at what point do they start the bat moving and things like that? And you really could actually uh, test these things, but that wouldn't go back to 2008. That would probably actually just be in the last year or two that we really have that sort of data um, that might help with that. You can pick up the noises from the trash cans, can't you? <laughs> you have to explain um, that to the non-baseball people. Yeah, so for, for those of you that didn't get that, the, uh, the baseball runner-up team last year um, is notorious for having cheated by using a trash can to um, well, so they were filming the signals between the catcher and the pitcher to figure out what pitch was going to come next. And then they would bang on a trash can really loudly to um, uh, to to signal to their batter what pitch was coming. Um, and somehow they got away with this for <laughs> for several years before getting caught um, this last season. Can I just jump in really quickly um, in response to the previous question as well? Um, I think one thing I just want to highlight is that we, the predictions in the, I mean, this isn't as fun as the trash can anecdote, but the <laughs> predictions in the paper are um, robust to whatever the batter is doing. So, so I, I think like what, like just to follow on to what Greg said, um, we can't actually test whether the batter is inattentive because we don't have this additional data for the batter, but the predictions we have don't, it's not like we're making the assumption that the batter isn't inattentive when we derive the predictions. They're all, um, we're using equilibrium payoff, so that sort of whatever's the whatever the batter's doing is whatever they're doing, and that'll it'll work whether or not they're inattentive. Prediction C requires, I don't think. Well, I guess prediction. No, C actually. Is event. Yeah, prediction C is actually a very indirect test of whether the batter is yeah. inattentive, because um, because we looked at the equilibrium payoffs of the pitcher, but those actually depend on the batter strategy, not the pitcher strategy. Um, and so uh, yeah. that would that would at least be kind of anecdotal evidence that batters do pay more attention or I mean, it's almost like batters pay more attention um, when when the stakes are really high. Yeah, but I guess A, B and D are just robustly or um, agnostic about what the batter's doing. That's yeah. OK, so Dennis says uh, I'm completely unfamiliar with these in the, with the inattention literature. It sounds to me like the issue is whether the player does or does not play the game, uh, play the game theoretically predicted optimal strategy and whether mm -hmm. they're doing so. Is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, that's really the, um, that's kind of the heart of what we were doing with our quote unquote prediction zero was that, I mean, Nash equilibrium makes a very stark prediction that in every state, payoffs should be equalized. Um, and we, reject that right that 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 is clearly not true based on our um based on the the regressions we ran for prediction zero um that once once you've kind of done that though you can imagine there are lots of different behavioral theories out there about why that might not be the case 
right? They're like, once you start thinking, okay, people aren't rational, um, then they can be irrational in, in dozens of different ways, right? Um, but we think that the way in which they're not being rational is this rational inattention uh, mechanism. And so that's what the rest of the paper is getting at is kind of showing, making predictions and then testing them um, in that direction. Yeah, so it, it just finishes by asking if, how is inattention different from just making a mistake? Uh, yeah, so, um, so if you just, um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I guess, okay, so there, there are two, a couple of different ways you could even interpret just making a mistake, right? Um, kind of the most natural one would be that uh, most of the time you're doing the rational thing and then occasionally you just mess up and, and throw a fastball even though you shouldn't be or something. Um, it turns out that if, if that's the case, then um, the batter's best response is you get all sorts of weird things in a matching pennies equilibrium where um, the best response for both players is in fact not to, uh, is maybe not to be mixing or, in, or to be mixing in very strange ways. Um, and so uh, that would violate um, uh, probably, uh, I mean, thinking off the top of my head, definitely prediction B, um, prediction C, and prediction D, and I maybe prediction A as well. Um, other ways that you could think about mis making mistakes are that like for whatever reason, like sometimes you really like throwing fastballs and sometimes you really don't like throwing fastballs. And that's not observed to the econometrician, but just like you have this this preference that's random and it comes in, right? And so that would kind of generate um, many of the same predictions. It, it in fact could predict A, B, and C, um, but it wouldn't predict prediction D. And that's actually what we got to in the very last slide that I kind of skipped over. Um, what what I was just describing is is what game theorists would say is quantal response equilibria, um, which is another kind of behavioral theorem or theory. Um, and so prediction D really distinguishes the rational inattention theory from the quantal response theory. Um, and in, I would say in favor of rational inattention. Okay. Uh... No more questions from uh, typed out. So uh, if anyone has any questions they want to ask, comments they want to make, uh, do feel free to unmute yourself and ask them or use the, the hand raising uh, feature. Um, so a question uh, is how would you imagine rational attention, for instance, in soccer penalty kicks? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I mean, I think with penalty kicks, actually, yeah, so so obviously um, a lot of our tests of Nash equilibrium is very similar to the famous paper on penalty kicks by uh, Levitt and co-authors. Um, the, I think the, the big difference, though, is that with baseball, um, your incentives change from state to state, right? In penalty kicks, I think the um, the incentives don't change. Some of the other things about the state conceivably could change. I guess like who who the goalie is or who the 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 striker is um, would change, and you could be inattentive to kind of what their um, what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and so you, I imagine you could you could some of these predictions would hold as well um, with penalty kicks. Um, I guess my, my, my gut feeling is that probably in soccer, you also don't really have enough data to test a lot of these predictions. Um, I don't know how many penalty kicks are taken every year, but it's probably well short of a million, which is about how many pitches are thrown every year. Um, uh, so, uh, so I don't know. And, and, and I think, it is in, in in some sense I, I I have a feeling that the penalty kick situ situation is is going to have um, kind of fewer differences from from kick to kick than uh, baseball will from pitch to pitch. But that's purely based on my prior. It's it's not. I'm not trying to say that it couldn't possibly work. I just wouldn't expect it to. <laughs> yeah, I can, a million penalty kicks a year. Maybe there is in the globe, <laughs> all around the world, perhaps. But whether there's <laughs> the nature of those kicks. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, any other? We've got time for probably one more question. We've got five minutes or so. Anyone has another question they want to ask or comment to make? Carl suggests uh, that the bowling a slower ball in cricket might be another application of of what you're looking at. Yeah, I, I from what I know of cricket, I think probably there are a lot of very similar tests you could design for for that setting. Um, I don't know the cricket data at all, uh, so so I have no idea if uh, if it's. Uh, Per, uh, as good as the baseball data is for this paper, but uh, I, the, the setup of the game itself seems uh, just as good. Yeah, I don't know to, to what extent you have ball by ball commentaries now that you can scrape, but whether they would necessarily have the, the detail required uh, in terms of, as you mentioned, the preparation or the way in which a mm -hmm. bowler goes about preparing. Yeah. Okay, well, in which case, uh, it's pretty easy right. to uh, wrap up and say thank you very much, Greg, for what was a really interesting talk. Thanks, Vivek, as well, for um, uh, taking part, for putting together the research. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, uh, paper, a really interesting context. And as you mentioned, you know, sport uh, does continue to be a great laboratory <laughs> for uh, all sorts of things through their <laughs> economics. And, Provides with a great, great, great thing to be doing. Um, <laughs> Indeed. Thanks yeah, well, 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 thank you very much, James, and thank you everyone that asked questions. I thought they were really good. So, and uh, yeah. we've got some things to do on, on our to-do list now. <laughs> great. And so next week uh, we're gonna have what have we got next week? We've got John Louis Fui uh, from the University of Montpellier assessment of probability forecasts uh, for the Champions League group stage matches, and Vincenzo Alfano. Uh, from Napoli, uh, an exploratory study of the impact of religion on s violence in sport. So two interesting talks uh, next week. Uh, but for, before we finish, thank you once again, uh, Greg and Vivek, and thank you to everyone who contributed, and have a great weekend. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Trying to stop the recording.